Well, greetings, everybody. My name is Kevin Rudd. I'm the president and CEO uh, of the Asia Society based in New York. We're a network of uh, 13 centers around the world, around the United States and around Asia, and now also into Europe. And our mission statement is how to build bridges between East and West. And speaking of that, uh, it's my pleasure today to add one further chapter in our ongoing series called Asia Society at the Movies. And that is where we bring to our audiences around the world uh, what is new and interesting and challenging and provocative by way of contemporary Asian cinema. And that means uh, documentaries, it means um, movies, it means also even um, science fiction and horror shows, a whole panoply of what's going on in creative Asia at the moment. And our definition of Asia uh, is the UN's definition. In other words, it's uh, all the way from uh, Tel Aviv in the West uh, to Tokyo in the East. And that, of course, uh, includes the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which brings us to the discussion we're going to have uh, today. And I'd like to invite two special guests uh, to our conversation about a movie called Born a King. And this movie is all about a particular king. Uh, and it is about uh, his reign as the first effective monarch of Saudi Arabia. Joining us in this conversation, um, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Prince Turkey Al Faisal, a friend of the Asia Society, one of our trustees, and also a distinguished public servant of the kingdom over many, many decades. Prince Turkey, welcome to our program. Thank you, Kevin. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Uh, and also, we're joined by Her Royal Highness Princess Rima Al Saud, the Saudi ambassador uh, to the United States from Washington. Ambassador, welcome also to our program. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be with both of you. Now, this is an extraordinary uh, opportunity because this is a movie about, frankly, how the kingdom came into being, or the modern kingdom came into being. And we have here two individuals in Prince Turkey, uh, the son of Saudi Arabia's uh, first king. Um, and uh, we have you, Ambassador, as that king's granddaughter. And so for our American audience, we couldn't ask for two, as it were, better connected individuals to give us an insight, not just into how the movie came about, but the story the historical story which the, which the movie seeks to tell. So perhaps I could start with you, Prince Turkey. How did the movie come into being in the first place? Whose idea was it? Uh, how did it get going? When was it made? And how's it going back home in terms of the box office? Thank you, Kevin. Um, may I just correct one thing? Uh, king Faisal was not the first king of Saudi Arabia. Uh, his father was the, the late uh, King Abdulaziz uh, Ibn Saud. And the film is about uh, uh, King Faisal's uh, mission by his father to attend the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 when uh, he was invited by uh, the King of the United Kingdom, King George V, uh, to attend. Um, the movie uh, started with a Spanish uh, director and producer um, uh, who uh, came to me and said that he had worked on a, a project of an opera about King Abdelaziz. And uh, in reviewing the history of King Abdelaziz, he, of course, read about the history of my late father and how he took this mission when he was 13 years old uh, to go from Arabia at the start of the 20th century, if you like, uh, to, uh, to the uh, capitals of the West, uh, starting with London and then going on to, to Paris. Andres Gomez is the name of the uh, Spanish producer who came with the idea. And this was, I think, uh, 19, uh, 2015, maybe 2016. And uh, we worked on it for a couple of years, two years. And uh, um, the King was, uh, the, the movie uh, was finally finished in uh, 20, I guess 2019 is when we first broadcast it um, to the public uh, in the kingdom and in the Gulf area. That is very briefly the story of how the, the film came about. So please uh, pardon me for uh, confusing the first two monarchs. 
Um, <laughs> but the fact that um, your father um, was dispatched to the United Kingdom uh, to deal with the British uh, as um, a very young boy, effectively the age of 13 or 14, is, is of itself remarkable. The historical context, of course, is the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, what therefore happens uh, with, uh, with Saudi, what happens with um, the kingdom, and uh, who actually um, um, becomes the custodian of the peninsula. And so why did your grandfather send a 13 or 14-year-old boy <laughs> off to the court of St. James as a diplomat? That's, I think, what the international audience would be very interested in. The uh, King Abdelaziz at the time, in 1919, had several sons. Uh, his older son at the time, uh, um, Turkey, uh, uh, died in 1919. And uh, his second son, was, uh, who became King Saud, uh, was with him in his campaign to unify the kingdom. Uh, and he was uh, a few years older than my father. And uh, he, he was needed to uh, support his father in the campaign uh, to unite the kingdom. And I guess, uh, uh, basically, as a 13-year-old um, who had already participated in one or two uh, battles with, with his father uh, on the ground to support the unification, um, King Abdelaziz felt that he could uh, do without him for a period of time. And so when the king received uh, the, the invitation from King George V, uh, he designated uh, my father to do that. But he also designated a few others to accompany him. Uh, one of them uh, was my maternal uncle, uh, my mother's uncle, um, Ahmed al Thunayan, uh, who was born in Istanbul under the Ottoman Empire, and he's from the Saudi family. He deserves another movie himself. Um, but uh, he was well educated in the ways of the West. He spoke French, he spoke Turkish, and of course, he spoke Arabic. And he had come to King Abdelaziz a few years before. And the king used him as an advisor on international affairs. So he uh, de uh, designated him to accompany my father to go to, uh, to the, the, the court of St. James and to Paris, uh, just to make sure that things were, were going well and, uh, and uh, to have someone who is savvy in world affairs uh, around my father. Well, tell me, Ambassador, um, you're a diplomat. Uh, you represent the kingdom now uh, in Washington, D.C. No small job for the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. In fact, no small job for any country uh, pointing their representatives uh, to what is still uh, the most powerful country on earth. As you reflect back on this extraordinary diplomatic uh, mission of your grandfather, um, how do you see a 13 or 14-year-old being able to succeed in such a mission, let alone bring King George V, never known for his sense of humour, by the way, George V, bring him on side. And what, what wily ways of diplomacy did he use? I'm fascinated. Um, Ambassador, over to you. So, you know, yes, he was young, but his life experience, as it was for many people at that time, was so much richer, I think, in briefer periods of time than children today. We have the luxury today of being children. At that time, life was difficult. Life was rough. They were on horseback. They were on war. They were unifying a country. So his actual physical experience of being a child, I think, didn't really happen beyond age nine. After nine, he was a man. He lifted his sword, he rode a horse, and he defended his territory with his father. In that, also being one of many brothers and having such an strong figure like King Abdelaziz guiding him through life, I think taught him the skills of negotiation, of diplomacy, of engagement, of strategic planning. And he had just by nature a foresight and a charm that is very, very unique to him. So when he was chosen and selected to go to England, along with the advisors that were with him, he knew to take the correct advice and he knew how to deliver. Um, his actual legacy for me is that he was a bridge builder that he could understand and empathize with other 
internalize it and then engage with them. And I think that is a diplomatic legacy that most diplomats would aspire to. How can we take at face value our experiences and balance them with what we're experiencing? And I hope that I'm able to follow in that legacy of his, of acceptance of other, but firm and strong belief in my own moral values, my own principles, but also what I represent and who I represent. And that was the magic of King Faisal. He was a king for our people, but able to engage with all people. So when uh, the young prince is there at the court of St. James, um, based on uh, what I've seen, he then strikes up a friendship with um, Princess Mary, uh, one of uh, King George V's daughters. And that actually begins to consolidate his relationship, of course, with the king. And the king's view and the prime minister's view of the United Kingdom at the time is quite decisive in terms of what's going to unfold uh, for, um, for the Arabian Peninsula. So tell us a little about that. How did he forge these relationships with the British royal family? My experience of the British royal family is that they can be a little stiff. And I imagine they were somewhat stiffer uh, back in um, the period that we're talking about. So what are your reflections on that, Ambassador? I you know, I could... Yes, I think my uncle would answer better. <laughs> I think, uh, if I may, uh, that is a sort of an artist's license, uh, if that is the right word for it. Uh, the scenario, um, uh, it, this is not a documentary, it's a docudrama. Yeah. And, and so um, uh, he did meet with Princess Mary uh, at, at a tea that the king gave to him when he was in London. Um, but the, the relationship between them was uh, enriched by, by, by the, the sinnerists' uh, imagination uh, more than, than, than the reality. To give, uh, to give uh, a bit of drama into the story and to, to keep the, the viewer's attention uh, going uh, <laughs> in, in the story. That's, that's what I can say about uh, Princess Mary's role in the film. But Amrak, if I could interject, I think sure. what's really fascinating is that, I, and perhaps I'm overreading into this, but because he was such a young, at a young age when he went to England and was exposed to Princess Mary, to many other women, I think coming back to the kingdom, understanding that our women could have the same rights, the same education, the same opportunities to engage that a Western woman could have, I do think somewhere in the back of his mind, he could see what other women looked like and what other women's experiences were. Because I'm sure you're aware he is the one who opened the doors for women's education along with my grandmother. You know, the kernels and the seedlings of that were in the kingdom, but he did it. Um, and he was a staunch, staunch ally and advocate for women and women's education, which I think is the key that unlocked what you see happening today in the kingdom we wouldn't be able to have Vision 2030 and talk about the economic inclusion of women and recognize that today women have an equal place in our society if King Faisal wasn't bold enough in his time to make that step. And I think having gone out at that young age, met all of these people and, and, and observed life in another place, I think a lot of that populated the innovations that he brought to the kingdom, but he brought them in his own style that were appropriate for our country rather than copying and pasting what he saw outside. So I think it was very, um, I think it was very important that he was there at that young age. You know, what's fascinating about um, the story about um, his impressions from the Royal Court at the time, uh, including his um, tea with Princess Mary and what uh, Prince Turkey just said about artistic license. Of course, there's another Brit at this time who engaged in significant artistic license. That's T. Lawrence. Um, and uh, Lawrence, of course, um, in his storytelling, um, uh, basically equals the future of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. This is very much his own artistic license about himself and about a series of, shall I say, traditions in English cinematography, which has built this man into this massive edifice, uh, when in fact, if we look at the, the movie, um, uh, T. Lawrence's role is um, not all that large. Now, I've got to say at this stage, uh, Prince Turkey and Ambassador, my college at Oxford is Jesus College Oxford, and T. Lawrence, uh, together with um, 
uh, together with Harold Wilson, are the only two notables uh, from that college. So I, I cannot speak, talk down Don't a college. Exclude yourself, and, Kevin. You are a notable <laughs> as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, these two are legends. The, um, but the bottom line is, when Americans and Brits think about uh, the immediate post World War One history of Saudi Arabia, uh, they think of Lawrence. Um, but I think it's important, um, as we discuss this movie, uh, to just put Lawrence's role in a bit of historical context. So, Prince Turkey, your reflections on fellow Jesus man, T.E. Lawrence, and his real role. <laughs> Lawrence worked um, in another part of, of, of the Arabian Peninsula than the one where King Abdelaziz yeah. operated. It was mm -hmm. the Hejaz, the western part of Arabia on the Red Sea. And he was engaged with um, another dynastic uh, family uh, that ruled in the Hejaz under Ottoman uh, Empire. And that then led to the revolt of the, to, that was called the, the Great Arab Revolt against the Ottomans during the war, the First World War. Yeah. This was the Sharif Hussein and his sons, uh, Faisal, another Faisal, mm -hmm. and Abdullah. Uh, and the third son, Ali, who succeeded Hussein before King Abdelaziz uh, united the Hejaz to his kingdom. Uh, mm -hmm. So Lawrence, during the war, worked in that part of Arabia, uh, which is not included in the story of my 13-year-old father when he was going from the center of Arabia, from Negev, from Riyadh, uh, to, uh, to mm -hmm. the United Kingdom and, uh, and France. So they, they had no connection whatsoever, historically, uh, with each other, either Lawrence or my father. And so, Ambassador, do you um, get asked often for your views on uh, Lawrence of Arabia, given that you're from, from the kingdom? Do you have to let Westerners down gently that this guy is not the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the man of, uh, of Western folklore uh, that we, we've all been told he really is? You know, what I think is really interesting about his story is, you know, everyone has to have a gateway into whatever theme they're going to discover and learn about. So Lawrence of Arabia is a great entry conversation to say he had phenomenal experiences. He came in and immersed himself into an element of Arabian culture. And then I can easily pivot and say, but let me tell you about Saudi and what our experience was and how we engaged mm -hmm. and what the world looked like to us. Um, and I never begrudge anyone's lack of knowledge because if they don't know, it means we didn't tell our story. And what I found yep. is um, you cannot expect other people to appreciate or understand your experience, your journey or your origin if, if you don't share it. And I think we get so consumed as diplomats talking about the here and now and today and where we'd like to go that we actually mm -hmm. forget to tell people how we got here. And if we don't have the context of our heritage, it's really difficult for a Western culture to understand a tribal Middle Eastern culture that is trying to evolve itself to be um, present and engaged and viewed equally as, as impactful as a Western culture. I think that's my biggest challenge. And there is a, a like for like of Lawrence of Arabia is, what's, is who is famous out of Arabia versus the Middle Eastern version that today my uncle is telling the story of King Faisal and born a king, a man from mm. our land who changed, yet the world knows Lawrence of Arabia who came and visited us and engaged with us. It's, it's a fascinating um, example of, we are finally telling our story and I wish we'd told it before, but today I, I'm, I'm very eager, honored and excited to have this conversation so that the Asia society can recognize Lawrence was there, profoundly impactful. Many wonderful people came through our lands, but what's our story? And this story, what's magnificent about it is it was actually written in Saudi Arabia. The actors were Saudi. It was filmed in the kingdom, but we had the expertise of the West. And by the way, that's exactly the story of oil in our country. That's the story of business in our country. We're doing it in collaboration. We are the best collaborators but we're looking for people that will come and help us up our game, help us engage, help transfer skills so we can co-collaborate, not people that will come and tell us what to do and then leave. And um, that's the legacy of Saudi. And I think that's a little bit different to the rest of the GCC because we were never colonized. So 
our engagement has always been collaborative. And Borna King, I think, is one of those phenomenal examples. And what I also love about this movie is it was actually filmed before Vision 2030 was a reality, before we had film studios and people were excited to have their children in films, before the industry was built, before the resources and the licensing, before anyone knew what to do with it. And so this is, I believe, is one of the triggers for some of the changes that you see today within our creative industries to say, look, if they could do it when the laws weren't open and accessible, imagine what we can do today where the environment is actually ready for, for innovation and creativity and culture. But it's another marker in the road of the progress of the kingdom. And I love the fact that it was King Faisal's story who was the change agent that was the one that opened so many doors for the kingdom to be that movie then that opens the door and inspires the creative community. No, it is quite a remarkable story, mm -hmm. and uh, and it it stands in its own right, without um, shall we say a um, uh, a minor British actor T. Lawrence sort of entering uh, entering on stage left, uh, helped by Peter O'Toole, I've got to say. Um, but what you're saying to me, Ambassador, is we'll take T. Lawrence, we'll take Peter O'Toole, and that gives us an entry point to the conversation about the history of the kingdom and where the kingdom is now, and we'll take that. Absolutely. Uh, by the way, the Chinese. The Chinese say the same to me about Marco Polo. They say, Marco Polo, what is it about Westerners and Marco Polo? By the time Marco Polo arrived in the court of the Yuan dynasty in China, uh, said we would probably have had mm, 40 to 50,000 foreigners uh, living in China at the time. He was just one of them. And uh, yet uh, in the West, um, particularly in Europe, I mean, this is seen as the, the great happening as far as this ancient civilization called China is concerned. So you got something in common with the Chinese there, I think. Um, tell me about the experience um, of the kingdom uh, and Arabia in terms of uh, the Ottomans. There are many, many different reflections about that period in history. Um, um, as you said just before, uh, Saudi wasn't colonized. The Ottoman influence, however, given the extent of the Ottoman Empire over centuries was profound across um, uh, North Africa, across um, uh, the Gulf, um, and of course, um, uh, Constantinople uh, and into Southeastern Europe. What's the Saudi reflection on this whole period uh, of the Ottomans? Um, perhaps I'll turn to you on this one, Prince Turkey. Um the Al Saud and, and the Ottomans didn't get along very well. Um, no, I, I figured that. <laughs> and, and in the middle of the 18th century, uh, a religious reformer in Central Arabia uh, called Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab uh, unified with uh, the emir or the prince of a small principality in the center of Najd called Dariya. His name was Muhammad ibn Saud. Hence the Saud family name. And in their um, religious reform movement, they inevitably came into conflict with the Ottomans, who at that time uh, were acknowledged as the rulers of, of, of Islam, of the, the caliphs uh, of, of, yeah. of Islam based in Istanbul. And with the expansion of the, of, the, of the reform movement in Central Arabia, of course, this uh, led to uh, armed conflict between uh, the Ottomans and the Al Sauds at that time. Um, the Al Sauds managed to take over the two holy cities of Islam at the beginning of the 19th century, I think in, in uh, 1805 from the Ottoman uh, governor of that, uh, that area. Uh, and of course, that led to uh, uh, an Ottoman army uh, invading Arabia to take back the two holy places from the Al Sauds. And the army that, that was chosen by the Ottomans was from Egypt, uh, from the Muhammad Ali, who was the founder of, of if you like, modern day Egypt at that time. Uh, to, okay. to invade Arabia to reclaim the two holy places from these upstart uh, Central Arabian 
reformists from their point of view, but heretics from the Ottoman point of view. And Muhammad Ali and his sons did succeed in, in, uh, in conquering uh, the Central Arabia and eventually uh, occupying the capital, the area of the Al Sauds. And when you come to Arabia, you inevitably have to go and visit the ruins that the Ottomans left of that of that uh, city in, in near uh, near Riyadh. Mm. And so uh, that is where uh, the 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 whole issue of Ottomans and Sauds became engaged. Now, when the Ottomans, after finishing occupying the area, when they left uh, because of a campaign begun by one of the descendants of Muhammad uh, bin Saud, whose name is Turkey as well. Um, this led to the start of the second Saudi state in the middle 19th century. And his, uh, uh, he moved the capital to Riyadh, but continued his campaign to try to unify other parts of Arabia to, to, to his rule. And he managed to get the eastern part, the Al Hassa, but not the Hijaz, the western part, where the Ottomans maintained their, their, their rule over the holy cities. However, um, his son, also named Faisal, who succeeded him when he was assassinated, um, had a conflict with the Ottomans where they sent an army that, uh, that captured him and took him to Egypt as prisoner. Um, in the meantime, when he was in Egypt, a cousin of his, called Thinayan, um, declared himself ruler in Riyadh in succession to Faisal and uh, remained there until Faisal came back and took over from him. His son, Nayan's son, Abdullah bin Thinayan, um, mm -hmm. when he grew up, he migrated to Istanbul uh, and, and and remained there uh, as an advisor to the Ottoman uh, Caliph on Arabian affairs. And it was his son, uh, Ahmed ibn Tnayan, who came to take uh, uh, Faisal bin Abdulaziz to London in the 20th century. So you see, it's all ties together from that aspect, the Ottomans and the Saudis, and finally uh, coming together in the of course, the, the, the disappearance of the, of the Ottoman Empire allowed uh, King Abdulaziz and others in the Arabian Peninsula to carry on without interference from the Ottomans. I hope I'm, I'm not too confusing in my presentation. <laughs> no, no, it's, a, it's, it's uh, for a Western audience, it's quite important. This, uh, the Ottomans have a complex relationship with everybody, <laughs> a complex relationship with the complex relationship with the Saudis, complex relationship with the Gulf monarchies, complex relationship, as I said, across North Africa, and certainly in Southeastern Europe, uh, ask the Greeks what they think about the Ottomans. I mean, there's, there is a very, very big historical footprint from this extraordinary um, empire. Uh, but I've always been fascinated by the imprint or the, the shadow uh, that this is, um, shall we say, left on the, on the wider region. Uh, tell me, Ambassador, you're now the representative of the kingdom uh, in the United States. In conveying um, what is happening in terms of contemporary Saudi culture, including what's happening with movies now uh, in uh, the kingdom um, and um, entertainment mm -hmm. and uh, women being able to go to the cinema um, and to all sorts of other public entertainments as well, how are you finding it in terms of taking the message out there to contemporary America? Are you pushing on an open door or are people still, as it were, captured by older mindsets? Over to you. You know, what I found very interesting is Washington, D.C. has a very particular mood and mindset, but the rest of America seems to be ready and willing to listen. And so I've taken it upon myself to make sure that I go cap state capital to state capital and engage with the people of each of the cities that I'm visiting. And I have found that there's always a misunderstanding because they actually, they don't even have Washington's mindset. They almost have no mindset about the kingdom. They really think it's 
just the open deserts, which is kind of shocking in, in 2021 that people would have that simplistic view of who we are in the Middle East. And so I'm able to go in and say, A, we're no different than you. B, our journey may have started at different points, but when it comes to the world of culture and arts, as Prince Turki can probably tell you from 1979, where the attacks of Jehaman happened in Mecca, the kingdom almost began to dim the lights and pull in. And when you do that, the first thing you stifle is innovation and creativity. And the second thing you stifle is culture and color. And so what Vision 2030 did is it just reopened and said, dear artists, creatives, you have a place here. Dear innovators and thinkers and dreamers, you have a place here, but it's not simply having a place. It's what is the infrastructure that needs to be built to allow those communities to thrive. If you want to change the mindset of a community, the first thing you have to do is give them license to dream because the things that they were raised thinking they cannot do are normal things. You cannot sing, you cannot dance, you cannot go out, you cannot engage, you know, you cannot write freely and you can't create. And that that's not a fun place to be. You will have seen the history of Saudis for about 20 years. Every school holiday, everyone would pack up their bags and leave the country. I can give you a data point. This year, my son, who's 19, wants to spend his winter holiday in the kingdom because the entertainment opportunities are there. His friends are there. There's things to do at home, which we didn't have before. That is symbolic of young leadership that wants to enjoy in their own country what the rest of the world enjoys in theirs. We have economic benefit because of it. But more importantly, we have a people who are happy and your people have to be happy at home. Your people have to believe they have an opportunity at home. Otherwise, what is the point of having a home? What's the point of having a root somewhere that you don't feel that that root can thrive? And there's every parent's dream is to make sure that the next generation inherits a land that's better than the one that they had. And that really has been the cycle of each of our leaderships. We've had the right man for the right time. When it was time to pull back, we pulled back. But the time today is to not just engage outwardly, but to open internally. The creative industries today are responsible for over 750,000 jobs because it's not just the filmmaker. It's the industry around film. It's not just the artist. It's the industry around the artist. And the economic impact of that is absolutely critical. The retail environment around it, the import, the export around it, the product that's created around it, the resources needed to create are a business industry that never existed. And a lot of people ask me about sports washing. And, and there's a small tie. I used to work at the Ministry of Sports and, and my uncle, Prince Tirki's son, was is the minister of sports and was my boss. And we used to get, you know, accusations of whitewashing, sports washing, culture washing, um, you know, pink washing by having women. And I would say, my God, for doing all that washing, we must be quite strong. Why can you not believe that the actual changes the kingdom are making is actually to the benefit of its people to allow our people to thrive, our people to have diversified economic opportunities, our people's opportunity to have wider educational opportunities, and a young people who aspire to more. It is the responsibility of the government to give more. And having those conversations, I will tell you, were so difficult over Zoom because it's this big of a conversation over Zoom, whereas the change that's happening is massive. And when I'm able to go and travel and engage with people, I take people with me. I show them, simply open up your phone and, and type in Saudi Arabia, activity, Saudi Arabia youth and go to images. What you will see will blow your mind because people cannot absorb that's happening in the kingdom. So as I travel, I'm not just talking to them about the youth revolution. I'm talking to them about the business opportunities, the opportunity for the kingdom to do well and for their communities to do well. And the only way for them to actually appreciate this change or this evolution that's happening is to come and see it. And you almost have to get over the fear factor of what you think you'll find to just come and find that the people there are just good people who want to raise their children, who would like to have opportunities, who want better for themselves and their families, which means they're actually no different than a family in Kansas or a family in Iowa or a family in, in, in Los Angeles, in California. We just have a little bit of, of 
aesthetic differences, but the, the needs are the same. Certainly that's my experience of Saudi kids um, studying in my country, Australia. Uh, we've had tens of thousands of, um, of uh, Saudi young people. And um, I'm always quite stunned just by the uh, level of modernity. Um, and, uh, and frankly, just normality. They're just kids doing what kids do. And uh, so it's, um, for me, it's always been encouraging. Uh, you mentioned before the uh, growing sophistication of form entertainment uh, within the kingdom. Um, uh, Prince Turkey, you've had a bit to do with this movie, um, uh, Born a King. Uh, I, I think you've got a new career ahead of you, my friend, <laughs> because the cinematography, in this, uh, the cinematography in this movie is really first class. Um, the, uh, the imagery uh, and the scenery and the way in which these images are captured, uh, you're, you're right out there. So we're going to call him Prince Turkey Cecil B. DeMille II uh, in terms of... Uh, your next, your next career, my friend. The um, on the production side, I'm kind of interested in this, Prince Turkey. Um, uh, how much of a role uh, did you play? Uh, were you sort of this uh, distant, as it were, guide, uh, or did you get right in there from time to time and tell them what to do? So the producer and and the scenarist actually uh, used me to look over what they produce in terms of a scenario. But I did not have anything to do with the actual production of going to the to the you know where they were filming or, or meeting with the actors and so on. I thought it that was not my role. First of all, I know nothing about acting, nor anything about cinematography. <laughs> so I would just be an encumbrance and and a hindrance to them rather than a help. But you know, uh, I I feel that that I did contribute uh, to the to the story in what I either edited in or tried to edit out. One, I'll give you one example where I, I failed uh, to edit in a suggestion that I had. In, 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 in the actual story of King Faisal's stay in London, having been ignored for at least a month or two by, by British officialdom, um, he decided to pack up and go to Paris. So he, he got his, 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 his people together. They, they booked a, a place on the train and they went, uh, and they actually went across uh, the channel into, into Paris. And uh, then the British government woke up, you know, that, that they had been ignoring this man that, that they had invited themselves. And they sent actually emissaries who reached him finally in Calais uh, and, and uh, convinced him to come back and from then he met with the officials and he was better treated and so on. I wanted to inject that into the movie, thinking that it would give it uh, drama. Uh, you know, imagine, yeah. you know, uh, the cars chasing and, and, and trains, you know, <laughs> chugging along and, and the boat going across and the British following and so on. But the sinner said, you know, if, if we do that, that's going to take at least an hour and a half of the movie, and, and we can't add it to the rest of the movie. So they chose only to show the indication of him going to Paris in the movie, as those who will watch the movie will see. Yeah. I'm on your side. I think that would have been a lot of fun. The, um, also, <laughs> it goes to the it goes to the four the 700 year long British pathology towards the French, and uh, <laughs> and uh, which is always fun to watch. And by the way, if uh, if he was left waiting for a couple of uh, weeks uh, by uh, British officials, can I just say uh, that's what they do to all of us who are colonials? So it's okay. That just that's their standard a standard pattern in history. <laughs> On the uh, ambassador, um, uh, I listened very carefully to what you said about Saudi youth. Um, you're a, a prominent Saudi woman. Tell us about the uh, current uh, circumstances of uh, women and girls. Um, if you were to go through the categories of change, um, say over the last um, five years, uh, what are they? So first I'll have to say that there's been profound change in women's rights and female inclusion in the kingdom. But that journey is never over because the needs of the generations of women of the future will be very different than the needs of the women today, as the needs of today are different than the past. So what we are putting forward as the reforms for female inclusion 
are the reforms that are needed for today's women. Um, and the future women will also have their journeys to tackle. But what we've done in the past five years is created equal job opportunities for women. There is no job that's not allowed to her. Access to uh, banking started many years ago, but the freedom to represent yourself as a woman, as an individual, is what's different today. A woman with her ID presents herself in court, represents herself at the bank. Women who are divorced today have rights that they were never awarded before. A woman today is head of household, which means she can make decisions on behalf of her children, which means she can travel with them, which means she can engage on their behalf, which she wasn't able to do. And she, I, I, I am that woman. I am a divorcee and I, I was a woman that was privileged to have a kind ex-husband who didn't say no to whatever I aspired to do with my children, but that wasn't a true narrative for the majority of women in the country. But today they have the right of law behind them. Women also do not need, as many people seem to assume, a male permission to go to the hospital for self-care or, or anything like that. Today women drive and driving is a tool mm -hmm. is not the end all be all of movement and mobility, but what it does is it allows the woman to thrive and engage in the bounties that the country offers her. We have female athletes, we have female musicians, we have female uh, politicians, we have women in industry, women in construction, women in military. It's boundless for us today. But what's different is not just that we are allowed to, because that, that word infuriates every woman, it's that we have the right to. And those are inalienable rights. Those are rights that we have equal to the men. And today the law is with us. The laws of the kingdom are changing. The laws of the kingdom are progressing. We have a massive initiative to canonize our law so that the law in the north of the country is equal to the law in the south of the country in precedence, in engagement, the, the structuring of um, you know, the judge's ability to pass sentencing is all being canonized. And that's what I think you're going to see the biggest differences in our country because it'll be equal. And a lot of people ask about equality for women. And I would tell you today, the right is with the woman and the law is with the woman, but we need to think in the mindset of equity because the skill is still being developed. So it's one thing to say women have equal access to the job, but if we haven't helped them in the capacity building to get that equal opportunity, it's a wasted equal opportunity. So we still do need to focus a little bit more in giving women the attention for the skills development, engagement, the networking and the mentoring. So when they stand on their own two feet, they are equal in capacity and capability, not just in right of opportunity. It's fascinating what you say on this score, and uh, I've mentioned this to Prince Turkey before. My wife, Therese, uh, ran um, businesses in Saudi for probably the better part of a decade, and her she owned the business, mm -hmm. uh, about 13 different centres in the kingdom, and her job was helping women into work. Um, and she had done this in some 13 countries around the world, starting in Australia, where she built a business from scratch. Um, and uh, she was uh, blown away by the uh, talent, skill, and enthusiasm of the young women that uh, she uh, worked with right across the kingdom. Now, I'm talking about uh, probably uh, a decade ago. Mm -hmm. um, and that's at a period when rights were not advanced at all. Um, so uh, she was part of uh, sort of the early journey, which is getting the training systems uh, established making sure that they were tailored to the, um, uh, to the interests and aspirations of women and to make sure that uh, women were not being simply pushed to one side. But her take from all of that is it's quite an extraordinary um, pool of talent you have uh, in, among Saudi women. Tell me again, Ambassador, in terms of the extension of education and training opportunities for girls, how is that going in the kingdom? Is it being rolled out fast enough? Is it, does it represent a big change on the, on the most recent past or is it still a bit on the slow side? Honestly, it's grown exponentially, not just from the point of view of expanding educational opportunities within the walls of the school, but the after-school activity, the learning programs, the um, holiday initiatives. I mean, I remember when I was younger, 
summer holiday was a summer holiday. You know, spring break was spring break. I'm looking at these young women now who are 16, 17, 18 years old, still in high school, signing up for all sorts of personal development programs, continuing education programs. They're speaking languages, French, English, uh, Spanish, Italian, Chinese, Korean. And these are ladies who aren't waiting to graduate high school to do this. They're joining programs that the MISC initiative has for the next generations of leaders. Our young women are engaging in model United Nations programs. They're engaging in debate programs. Uh, they're taking summer courses at Harvard, Stanford. They're going to the UK. The thirst for personal development of these young women is unbelievable and the opportunities there. And the reason the opportunities there is we have young leadership. We have young leadership that's looking at the rest of the world and saying, why would we want to wait for a youth revolution to take over for change to happen? What can we define as our youthful evolution? And I, Prince Turki always says, the process of change in the kingdom, it's not about modernization or westernization or revolution. It is an evolutionary process. But our evolution is led by young people. It is led by the theme of culture engagement, global engagement, and how can we have a thriving and ambitious youth base that is a gift to the world rather than an ambitious and young base that actually becomes a burden to the world. And we had a choice to make as a nation. What are we going to do? Who are we? What do we subscribe to? Who do we want to be? And that's what the vision is. The vision is Saudi's place in the world as a leader, as a collaborator, not just with what happens in our country as an oil producing nation, as a transactional nation, no longer. We are going to be the leaders in youth and thought. We are going to be the leaders in this world of renewable technology. We're announcing our, our initiatives next week in the Saudi Green Initiative. And half of it is for ourselves and the other half is to be that good global partner. And we need symbols of hope in the Middle East. We need symbols of innovation. We need symbols of, for the rest of the Middle East, what do responsible institutions look like? And what does a thriving youth population look like? Imagine if what was happening in the kingdom was happening in Iran. Imagine if Iran was in a G20 with us as a collaborator, where our collective female force, our collective youth force was operating for global good, rather than a Saudi that's trying to thrive and an Iran that's trying to destroy the institutions around us. It's just, it's sad. Imagine if Born a King was a story in Iran of their youth, youthful leadership at that time, by the way, it is youthful leadership again that's changing our nation. What would that have looked like rather than a catalyst of light and dark if it was light and light mm. and positive reflection? That, that's our goal to show the rest of the youth populations of the Middle East what positive leadership looks like, what healthy institutional design looks like, and what it means to actually have opportunity. Can I just add one thing? So, uh, uh, by all means, um, Prince Turkey. Yeah, you know, and it's right, you're talking about development of women and so on, but it's had a, a profound effect also on the male youth mm -hmm. uh, in the kingdom. Uh, they're equally more engaged today than, than before. And I think having competition from their uh, female siblings is driving them also to, to, <laughs> to be more open, more engaged, and, and acquiring more knowledge and, and skills as well. So it's, it's benefiting both, not just the women. True. Well, I think uh, you're, you're both absolutely right on that score. Coming from a family myself, Ryan Day very strong mother. I have a very strong wife. I have a particularly strong uh, uh, daughter. And now I have a ferociously strong little granddaughter who you'll be pleased to hear, Ambassador, at the age of nine, marched herself off to the student strike the other day in support of COP26 on climate change. So, so we, uh, a, uh, we have a, a family of strong girls and strong women. Uh, we're drawing to the end of our time now. I'm going to ask one or two final questions. And uh, let me pose um, uh, one to you, Ambassador, and then I'm going to come to you, Prince Turkey, to close out. 
Um, Ambassador, you've just touched on um, your green initiative, which is coming up. Um, how does the kingdom now look at uh, COP26? Uh, it's just around the corner. Uh, Glasgow awaits. Uh, the kingdom has a particular history in terms of hydrocarbons. By the way, so does my country, Australia, in terms of coal and, uh, and gas. So how does the kingdom now approach the challenges of global climate change? So really interestingly, Aramco was an innovator in, in the energy narrative. We never did the off-gassing. We preserved everything, captured it, and stored it and used it. So the concept of recycling and reusing was born into our main industry. And I think that comes a little bit from the Bedouin mindset of use everything you can because you don't know if you're going to have it for a long time. And so that idea is, is, is already within our, our cultural narrative. Um, but with COP26, I think what's really interesting is I find in the West, which is fantastic, you're looking for all of these futuristic technological scientific innovations to restore balance to the environment when there are some very, very simple basic things we can do, but they involve individual and personal responsibility. The Kingdom's um, Saudi Green Initiative is looking to plant 10 billion trees in Saudi and 40 billion to our neighbors. Why? Because in the process of doing that, we're not only re and engaging with the nature of our country, we're going to have water capture, we're going to reduce the temperature by two to three degrees, which will have a profound impact on, on our communities. But also we need to look at basic practical activities that an individual's responsibility is to the environment around them. We're trying to bring this back to human scale. If you have more trees, they eat up the carbon naturally normally. Um, and, and you don't always have to go to the processing of innovation when nature can do the job for you. But we're addressing issues of desertification, water capture. We're taking the, the baseline things. And if you don't start at point A, you have no foundation to build point B, C, and D. And when you look at the kingdom, you look at the Middle East, and you look at Africa and the developing world, I would say, they do not have the luxury to walk away from their day-to-day -day energy supplies. So it is a very uh, superior point of view to say we're going to get rid of all of the oil and we're all going to move to all of this phenomenal technology. Well, have you thought of the developing world? What would it look like if we could do a graduated change? So the kingdom's message is we will be leading in the energy markets of the future because it's within our personal developmental needs but we're going to make sure that the developing world comes with us. So it will never be at their expense and it won't be at the expense of the economies of the world, but it will be to the betterment of, of the global environment, but people need to be involved. It's not just about the technology. And so we're doing a lot of um, education on leave no foot behind, um, clean, clean water, clean energy, renewables. Uh, we're investing heavily in hydrocarbons. We're investing heavily in solar. Um, and, and we're also educating our young people on the value of their environment. 30% of the country today is um, conservation land. We're repatriating the Arabian leopard. We're repatriating the cheetah, anti-trafficking laws, um, animal welfare laws, uh, native trees so that we're not destroying water tables and importing phenomenal, beautiful flowers and trees from all around the world but they end up ruining our, our natural environment. So we're taking it back to the basics. Ms. Chucky, um, we're here to talk about a movie. And, um, and my last question for our discussion today is, um, in two or three sentences, give us your best summary of what you think King Faisal's greatest achievements were for the kingdom. And secondly, if he were with us today, what would his reflection be on the kingdom which uh, Rena has just described for us all, this modern kingdom? Over to you to take us out, um, Prince Turkey. Well, Rima has already mentioned one of his greatest legacies, which is women's education. As she rightly said, it was the key to what is happening today in Saudi Arabia. Um, another achievement was to safeguard the, the, the security and stability of the kingdom at a time when it was under threat by what was happening around it in the Middle East. If you remember, 
the, the, the communist and, and, and sort of nationalist a combination of uh, ambitious rulers in other countries wanting to uh, impose on the kingdom either their lifestyle or get access to the kingdom's uh, oil uh, in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. Uh, he was there to, to safeguard the unity of the kingdom at that time of great conflict and social upheaval in, in the Middle East. That is another achievement. That, um, you know, the day before he died, uh, King Faisal was interviewed by an American television reporter who asked him, how do you see Saudi Arabia in 50 years time? Uh, his answer was, I see Saudi Arabia in 50 years time as a wellspring of radiance for humanity. And I think this is what Vision 2030 is achieving for us today, being the wellspring of, of, for, for humanity uh, and I am a senior citizen in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> so uh, and everybody talks about Saudi Arabia being, you know, a youthful country, and it is. And I think something like 70% of our population is under the age of 35. But the, 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 the aspirations and the inspiring of, of Vision 2030 to those youths has equally inspired a senior citizen like myself. Um, and I, I do hope that what Rima was mentioned about the future for our kids and grandkids and great grandkids is what is being constructed nowadays uh, in Saudi Arabia's uh, uh, activities. And this is what we look forward to in the future, inshallah. Well, thank you so much, both of you. Um, Her Royal Highness, Princess uh, Rima al Sal. Uh, Prince Turkey Al Faisal, this has been a great conversation. Um, Prince Turkey, as I said, you have a new career as the kingdom's new Cecil B. DeMille. Uh, this will be the first of many productions. Um, and uh, and uh, Rima, I think you're going to have uh, a, um, a highly successful and distinguished diplomatic career, and perhaps I think not just in Washington. But uh, certainly here at the Asia Society, we wish you both well. Uh, and uh, we uh, hope that the, uh, the movie does well in explaining this extraordinary period uh, in the historical evolution of the kingdom. Um, and this series, a part of Asia Society at the Movies series, is uh, part of building bridges between the countries of Asia, the countries of the West, understand culture, understand history, understand literature, and through that to understand politics, difference, as well as commonality. Thank you so much. Thank you, one and all. It's been great to Thank be with you. you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you, Rima. Thank you, Hali. Mm -hmm. <laughs>